Shall I start? Yeah. Is Yeah, we are live now. Let's start then. Wait a yeah, second. Wait, 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 please wait, please wait. Good evening, everyone. No, please wait. Please I would wait. like to welcome you to this webinar session organized by GAMES. GAMES is a global association of please Indian wait. medical students and it's a nonpartisan, non-political organization that aims at the holistic upliftment of medical students all over the globe. Today, we live in a world that has seen great disruption owing to the COVID pandemic. As medical students, it is our responsibility to be on top of our game when it comes to medical updates. With the same in our mind, we are organizing this webinar to give you a deep insight on the pathological aspects of this pandemic. This pa session will be taken by Dr. Praveen Kumar Gupta, who has completed his MBBS from CMC, MD from Ames Delhi, and is a faculty of great repute and renown at DBMCI, and is an author of several bestsellers. So it is truly a great honor to have you speak to us. Any queries you have can be asked on the YouTube chat, and they will be answered by Sir as per their merit. Also, at the end, we will be sharing a post event form that you can fill so as to get your certificates. Thank you, and over to you, Sir. Well, thank you very much, Aditya. Uh, thanks for the uh, great, thanks for the great uh, invitations, and um, I welcome you all to my session. Uh, so this session is all about learning about COVID, but not exactly is it all about COVID, uh, because what I understand is oh, you are a medical graduates of first year, second year, right from the first year to the final year. So what I believe right now is knowing not knowing about COVID is as much a big dangerous task for you all as much it is about not even knowing the patience of COVID. So what I want to tell you here is, so you will be joining very, uh, very uh, soon to your own medical colleges. And when you go back there, people are talking about COVID, right? Now, if people are talking about COVID and you don't know a thing about COVID, it will feel a bit weird. The second why you should know about COVID is that when you are actually going to the hospitals right now, most of the hospitals are actually filled up with the patients of COVID. So when you see a patient of COVID, you should know in detail what is the basic epidemiology of COVID, what is the basic pathophysiology of COVID, clinical features, diagnosis and everything, what not about COVID, including the drugs of COVID. Now, when we talk about the pathophysiology, you know, pathophysiology is a very broad term. So when I say it's broad term, diagnosis and everything. when I say broad term, what I want to tell you is, it's not only about knowing how does a COVID infect a body, it's not only about knowing how a COVID-19 is diagnosed, but it should include a holistic approach as to if you know about COVID, I really think you should be able to think in a different out of the box and maybe come up with a better way to treat COVID. Okay. So uh, this all uh, session that I'm going to take, it's all about the various studies that has been done. Um, obviously, as you know, nothing has been published in the textbooks. So all I'm talking about is from the various literatures. I have read about the various articles and journals, uh, including New England Journal of Medicine. I have read about the Lancet, the cell, and um, I will try to make it as easy and as you know uh, uh, interactive as possible, so that we can uh, gain a lot from this session. So here I am, Dr. Praveen Kumar Gupta, uh, starting the session on the COVID. Before that, uh, I will just request all of you to let me know if I am audible and visible to all of you. Yes, very good evening to all of you. Uh, very good evening to all of you. I can see a lot number of participants who has actually uh, joined and I am very sure that you all are very excited to know about the new things that have actually have come into COVID. We'll, we'll talk about everything, you know. So uh, when I say I will talk about everything, what I, may, what I want to tell you is that we'll talk about, we'll talk about the various diagnostic patterns, we'll talk about the pathophysiology and everything. Let's talk about 
first of all what does this virus mean to us apart from the biggest pandemic it has created what does this virus mean to us now this virus it has a unique structure okay this unique structure is a, there's actually a 3d structure and this virus so this virus you see these you know what are these these all are the spikes coming out of this virus and i'm telling you guys this spike will create a such an impact in your mind today that you'll understand how does this virus actually get into our body just by this spike protein this is called as s spike protein i'll talk about this again later but what is more interesting is what is inside this virus and what is inside this virus is just a single standard rna just imagine you know um, i i'm very sure that you have read in biology virus is a non living structure it is neither living it's it actually is a non living structure because virus is just made up of proteins and a, 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 a dna or rna structure this virus being a rna structure so only has a single strand rna yes a positive single strand rna with a protein and that is what this virus is all about and imagine what it has created now are you not interested in knowing how is the single smallest particle creating such a havoc pandemic throughout the world and if you are please stay with me for the next one hour where i'll make this entire story very easy and interesting to you all let's start with the we'll start with the basic structure of this virus okay um yes you will need to write down the notes if you want to but more importantly what i want you all to is just focus on the things dekho basically guys look at this thing this this thing here this one here this one is the basically the i'll say it's a bilipid envelope okay it's a bilipid envelope as you all know all lipid membranes are made up of bilipid envelope so this is a bilipid envelope this one okay now what is on this what is basically on this is actually these are the spike proteins this this one is a spike protein now this spike protein it is looks as if this virus is actually having a crown on his head now because as it has a crown on his head is called as corona virus the word corona means a crown the word corona means a crown that is what this virus is all about but not only the lipid envelope not only the crown this virus has some envelope proteins envelope and has some membrane proteins so this virus on the surface has some proteins what you must know they are the bilipid envelope they are the spike s protein they are the membrane protein and they have the envelope protein so how to know this guys i again tell you they have the s protein spike they have the m protein m they have the envelope protein e and apart from this look what it is has inside it this is the rna inside the virus this is the rna inside the virus because this rna in the virus i'm telling you it is just a single strand positive sense rna nothing more than that it is just a single strand positive sense rna nothing more than that so this entire structure is the virus and because it's crowns coming out of it it's called as corona virus and skip the basics i know we are well aware of the basics and the basic is why it is called as covid 19 it's called as covid 19 because it's co that means corona v which means virus d which means disease and 19 means discovered in 2019 so these are the basic thing that you must all be knowing about okay uh, now it is also called as sars cov 2 so sars cov 2 is the severe respiratory disease sars cov 2 is the severe acute respiratory disease in the coronavirus form 2 why 2 because sars cov 1 sars cov 1 was also another disease which was actually caused in 2013 epidemic and pandemic but this is sars cov 2 not sars cov 1 now if i tell you about the basic things look i don't want you to keep on writing things but i just want you to keep on knowing the basic thing that will help you a lot in knowing about a patient knowing about the virus and one of them is one of them is the basic classification of the coronavirus so this corona virus also called as sars cov 2 also called as sars cov 2 it belongs to the order nidovirus in which it is a family of the corona viridi the family name the family name is corona viridi okay so these basic thing you must know because other than that it's all about the facts okay now the sub family the sub family if you say the sub family is actually the corona virini okay corona virini okay corona virini and actually it comes in various lineages like the alpha beta it actually comes into alpha beta the alpha beta gamma and delta in this beta there is another a b c d a b c and d 
But what I want you just to know here is the SARS-CoV-2 belongs actually to this B. Okay, the B in the beta in the Corona Virini subfamily, which belongs to the Corona Viridi family. So here is where our virus is SARS-CoV-2. This is where the virus belongs. SARS-CoV-2. Yes. Now, guys, look. The structure is a bit important. Now, why should you know the structure again? Because these all proteins will be important when you diagnose this condition. I am again telling you, at the last, when I talk about the diagnosis, I will talk about all these proteins again. I will talk about the S protein, I will talk about the M protein, I will talk about the E protein and everything else. So make sure you know the structure. You know the structure. Okay. Now, so basically, if you talk about this viral structure, you talk about this virus structure. Now, if I just show you this virus again, this is the virus. There is a bilipid envelope. There is a S protein. There is a S protein. There is a M protein and there is an envelope protein. Inside this, there is a positive strand RNA. There is a positive strand RNA. But apart from this protein, the I'll say the RNA, this, this RNA here, it also has some open reading frames, ORF. And this ORF actually codes for non-structured proteins. Now, if you know about the viruses, what viruses do, it is common about all the viruses. Let's talk about HBV, HCV and everything else. What happens, guys, these viruses actually have some structural genes which codes for the structure like the membrane, like the envelope, like the spike. Those are the structures. But apart from them, they have some non structural proteins also called as ORF, ORF genes coding for some ORF proteins. So basically they are the non-structural genes, non-structural genes. Okay. Now, again, let's not go to the very uh, detail of this, but there are few uh, sequential events that you should know about the timeline, the timeline. Okay. The timeline of these uh, viruses. So the questions I'll take at the last, don't uh, bother about the questions, first know about the basic facts. So this uh, this virus actually uh, it was first reported in the in the city of Wuhan as you all know in the city of Wuhan and lot number of cases actually uh, was reported in the Wuhan at that time nobody bothered about it because one of the theories the country did even uh, the country China did they didn't didn't know about how severe the virus could be and then they named it the novel cov virus the novel coronavirus and then when it came to the India so the first case in India the first case in India was actually reported in the year 1st December okay 1st December was the first virus when it was discovered on 31st December this virus was named as the virus was named as SARS-CoV-2 okay it was late in the January that the 7th January and the 9th January when the WHO told it can be a actually it could be actually a case of Oh, sorry, the first case uh, in India was the 30th January. Sorry, the first case in India was the 30th January. Very sorry, the first case already in the world was the first January. So the uh, the first case uh, in India was on the 31st 30th January. Please, I'm just correcting it. Okay, the SARS uh, the SARS CoV-2 it was named on the 11th February. Okay, 11th Feb it was named as SARS CoV-2. Okay, SARS CoV 2 and late in the around the March, around the 11th of March, 11th of March, the WHO called it a international pandemic. WHO called this international pandemic. Okay, international pandemic. Okay, now see, you know, there are a few things that, that again you should know, and that is about the other type of SARS CoV. Now, I, I understand that we don't, are not talking about the SARS CoV 2. But what about the other virus like the SARS-CoV, like the SARS-MERS-CoV and the SARS-CoV-2 now? That means that do we do we need to know about the origin? Yes, a bit about origin you should all know about. I'll just tell you about that. So basically, the pandemics that you must know, the year of pandemic, it was in 2013. Okay, then it was in the 2000, uh, around so 2003 first, 2003, 2013 and now we are into 2020. Okay, the first one in the 23 was the SARS CoV. Now, we will not call this SARS CoV 1, but some of the books will call this SARS CoV 1. It's okay to call SARS CoV 1 also. The 2013 was all about the MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syncytial Virus, called as MERS CoV. It is called as MERS CoV. Okay, MERS CoV. And this 2020 gave us the SARS CoV 2. SARS COV-2. Now, what is interesting to know is the reservoir of this reservoir. Now, this is very, very interesting. Guys, the reservoir of the SARS-CoV-1 was believed to be the bat. 
the reservoir of the Mars cough was believed to be the camels. Okay, the so it was the bat again, and this again is the bat. But if you talk about the intermediate host, that becomes interesting. If you talk about the intermediate host, intermediate host, then it becomes very interesting. See, the SARS-CoV-1 had the intermediate host of the civet cat. Civet cat. The SARS-CoV-1 MERS -CoV had the intimate host of camel. And the SARS-CoV-2, that's a present epidemic, the pandemic, I should say, not actually epidemic, the pandemic has an intimate host of pangolins. Okay, pangolins. So I would all, uh, I would request you all to at least know about this one. At least know about this one. Okay, so yes, the bat is a reservoir for all of them, but the intimate host is a bit different and therefore this becomes very, very important question for you all. Okay, now. Transmission you all know and I, I I don't think I should say anything further on that But yes, I just mentioned that for the, the completion of the topic Tra transmission Is basically by the the transmission is basically by the droplet infection which can be contact or airborne Okay, it can be droplet It can be contact Or it can be airborne Now this airborne this airborne is again very important because now to see when something is actually airborne it can transmit in the community also and particularly that is what is happening now in some cities of india and in the world that means not only with the the contact directly in the in the form of aerosols there is some evidence that it can also go in the airborne infection okay airborne infection okay so airborne infection are those which actually have a size of less than 5 mm remember this less than 5 mm is the size of those particles and therefore these particles can travel a lot higher distance but the size of droplet infection is more than 5 mm therefore if a size is more than 5 mm the transmission is not very very far so it was initially believed to be just a droplet infection but nowadays it believed that it can be droplet it can be airborne also okay that means it can travel a short distance of say six feet so i hope you have heard che gachki duri Bohat hai zaruri, but it can also travel more than that and therefore the airborne has now important role to play. Now, see guys, uh, when we talk about the pathogenesis, this is very interesting. But basically, we are all gathered today to understand the pathogenesis of this virus. Okay, pathogenesis of this virus. I'll, I'll, I'll take all your questions later on. Let's just flow in the topic right now. I'll take all your questions and everything that you have at the last of this session. Okay. So what is the pathogenesis of this virus? Very interesting again. So guys, let me just bring you to the uh, lungs. So remember one thing, the multiplication, this is very, very interesting. The multiplication of the virus occurs in the upper respiratory tract. Now, this is very interesting. Actually, what happens when the virus goes through the uh, nose root or the mouth root, it actually multiplies in the upper respiratory tract in this area. But understand, even though the multiplication happens in this area, the disease is here. The disease is not here. Okay. That means this virus is not shown to cause a very severe case of sinusitis, otitis media or say pharyngitis or laryngitis. Basically, this virus is all known to cause the disease lower down in the lungs called as pneumonia or ARDS. I again repeat, multiplication occurs here, but disease process occurs here. And that is what is very important in this virus because because of multiplication here, the virus spreads just like anything. It has been shown that one virus, suppose a person comes in contact with three people. That means suppose there's a patient who comes in contact with three other people, the three people will get affected. But if you look at the same thing from an individual aspect of view, from suppose a normal uh, a pneumonia, like suppose if you talk about the Cytokos pneumonia, or just talk about any other virus that you have been known. So basically, the other viruses will infect one out of three people, but this virus will infect three out of three. And that is why the virus becomes more and more dangerous. Okay. What I'm trying to say is, a usual pneumonia causing virus will infect just one out of three people from the patient. But this virus can infect three out of three from this person, from this person. Okay. So now see, now see, basically we look at the pathogenesis now. Look what happens. 
suppose there is a, this is the trachea there is a bronchus okay now divides into bronchioles and terminal bronchioles you all know those things okay now see this is the lungs okay this is the lungs like this okay now see guys this is all the about the divisions and let's assume after dividing this is the alveoli okay these are alveoli now i will talk about this virus getting into the alveoli here suppose this is the sars cov2 that's a covid virus this is sars cov2 i'll talk about what does this virus do when it actually goes here what does the virus do when it actually goes here so what to do understand this suppose i'll enlarge this portion in a separate diagram i enlarge this portion separately here now this is very very interesting i am very sure you are all taking notes and make sure you at least know this portion down okay look what happens so to understand this portion let me make a alveoli this is the alveoli okay and just below this alveoli i am making a pulmonary capillary like this okay a pulmonary capillary like this now if going to the basic thing i hope you all know that all this alveoli are lined by the type 1 the type 1 nemocytes like this the flattened epithelial cells they are called as type 1 nemocytes then just to make your things very cl clear i am just shading this area into two parts on left side i will draw the normal part on right side i will tell you what happens in the sars cov2 okay just to make things very clear for you on the left side i will make the normal things on right side i will show you what happens in the sars cov2 infection okay now they go what happens guys let's assume there's a there is a normal thing so this are all the this one here is the type 1 okay it's a type 1 nemocyte okay now if you know the basic anatomy and the physiology see this here is the type 2 nemocytes and i hope you all know this a club shaped cell with a surfactant inside this a club shaped cell with a surfactant inside this okay now this thing here this thing here is a type 2 nemocyte type 2 nemocyte it's a type 2 nemocyte now just listen to me carefully you all might be knowing that there are macrophages in this area here these are all the macrophages the normal alveolar macrophages in the cell like this these are all macrophages now see what happens this virus let's assume this is the coronavirus this is a coronavirus this virus will first enter via the type 2 nemocytes it has been shown the reason is this type 2 nemocyte have the receptor called as ACE2 receptor now this receptor here this receptor here this one is the ACE2 receptor now i'll talk about the entry point and the multiplication point in this nemocyte again in detail also but right now right now just listen to me that this sars virus has entered this entered this in, inside now suppose this is a nemocyte nemocyte and the virus enters from inside what happens this virus will keep on multiplying 1 ka 2 2 ka 4 4 ka 8 and this whole nemocyte will burst the whole nemocyte will burst and when it bursts a huge amount of virus released from this huge amount of virus released from this and this will fill up the entire alveoli and i'll talk about this again detail in a separate image again okay make sure you're watching the entire video don't stop in between okay now see what happens this bursting of the type 2 nemocyte releasing huge number of sars cov 2 releasing huge number of sars cov 2 this will also release some of the cytokines and this will also be taken up by the macrophage so this macrophage will now take up this sars cov 2 and because of the sars cov 2 getting inside the macrophage the macrophage will now release huge amount of cytokines will release huge amount of cytokines namely the interleukin 1 interleukin 8 and interleukin 6 along with huge amount of tnf alpha well among them for you an uh, important question that will always be asked is remember this thing and don't forget il6 this will be a very very important course when you want to look at the immunomodulation of this sars cov2 infection but right now remember it's il1 il8 il6 along with along with the tnf alpha okay now see what happens they go they go what happens these all cytokines goes here and these cytokines they activate the neutrophils they activate the neutrophils here the neutrophils are all activated okay so they activate neutrophils guys the neutrophils they'll first damage they'll first damage the endothelium 
they'll damage the endothelium not only they will damage the endothelium now what happens guys this endothelial damage because the endothelial damage the fluid starts coming out and because of this this will lead to interstitial edema the whole fluid starts putting up here okay now see what happens this fluid coming out from this into this area it is called as guys interstitial edema interstitial edema and no doubt it has caused endothelial damage because of which there is interstitial edema it has also lead to cause it also causing vasodilation along with the along with the edema now guys what happens this neutrophils they also enter inside this area now very interesting things are coming up yes it's a bit different from the normal ARDS you might be all thinking sir it is going towards ARDS yes it is exactly going towards A ARDS but there is a lot of difference I'll tell you about that watch the video completely there go what happens guys this uh, this new neutrophils has reached this area now this neutrophil will now damage this type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes will now damage the damage type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes because of which the fluid which is basically reached this area the fluid will now enter this area and lead to yes you guessed it correctly will lead to pulmonary edema this will lead to pulmonary edema now this pulmonary edema is often picked up in the CT scan and therefore you are now reading the coats the corats uh, I'll say classification in the CT scan which can actually could in a better way predict whether it is a coronavirus or not but these are not exactly definitive markers but they help a lot in diagnosis now see what happens the type 1 pneumocyte causing damage will lead to extensive hypoxemia will lead to extensive hypoxemia and type 2 pneumocyte damage will lead to the alveolar collapse alveolar collapse they will lead to alveolar collapse okay now see what has happened guys this is completely going in lines of ARDS so yes actually to be very frank it leads to ARDS but what are the difference the difference is the difference is see what happens this is a virus to fight with the virus to fight with the virus all cells will take part but if you talk about the virus particularly the lymphocytes are the male male main role to play now see because of the extensive virus coming out here the lymphocytes here they start accumulating the lymphocytes start accumulating in this area guys these are all the b and the t lymphocytes let me mark them these are supposedly the b and the t lymphocytes and that is the reason that because in the alveoli this huge lymphocytic infiltrate in the blood you will find lymphopenia lymphopenia is a good sign in the complete blood count which indicates towards a COVID-19 infection so remember guys they will lead to ARDS with septic shock like features with septic shock like features okay very severe lung collapse it can lead to lung collapse and eventually this will lead to death if the patient is not properly ventilated this will lead to death and remember in the blood in the blood right now the complete blood count you will find uh, what is find is lymphopenia and this will be seen as what you don't be surprised but it's seen as relative lymphocytosis sorry relative relative neutrophilia that means often in a complete blood count you will see a finding like the neutrophils example the neutrophils are reaching 90 percent and the lympho is reaching 10 percent and you think and you think it is what it's a bacterial infection but then you see because the lymphocytes have entered into the alveoli the TLC has gone down and therefore there should be a low TLC and a low TLC low TLC with a high neutrophil count is what you often see in a case of COVID-19 infection again it's a good good thing that you should know about ARDS you should all know about ARDS okay now see Having known all of this, let's now talk about let's now talk about how does the virus enter the how does the virus enter the type 2 pneumocytes. Now, this is again going to be very, very interesting. Yes, let's see that. So I hope you understood this whole thing. 
this whole thing is all about the SARS-CoV-2 basic pathophysiology and I'll, because you know this I will tell you the treatment guidelines for you will become extensively easy which I'll discuss at the last of this entire discussion see now see the entry of virus in entry of virus in type 2 nemocytes this is very interesting entry of virus in the type 2 nemocytes now see very carefully what I'm trying to do is I'm try, I'll try to make a type 2 nemocyte and I'll, I'll explain to you how does this SARS-CoV-2 enter a type 2 nemocyte and then will lead to all the steps of virus you know multiplication that means the attachment I hope you all remember that steps attachment penetration uncoating biosynthesis assembly assembly then it will cause the maturation and finally the release of the virus release of the virus so how does that all happen what happens guys see suppose there's a type 2 nemocyte like this this is type 2 nemocyte okay this is type 2 nemocyte now on the type 2 nemocyte there is a receptor called as ace 2 receptor it's a ace 2 receptor first of all don't confuse this don't confuse very sorry very sorry, very sorry, 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 sorry. Very sorry. Okay, something accidentally got pressed. See, okay. so, they go basically the SARS CoV 2 virus, it actually it don't confuse this one to the ACE receptors. It is not the normal ACE receptor, it's all about the ACE 2 receptors. All about the ACE 2 receptor. They go what happens the ACE 2 receptors, ACE 2 receptor, may kya the SARS CoV 2 it can enter inside assay. Okay, Deco, the SARS CoV 2 can enter via the A receptor. I can tell you, don't confuse this one to the normal angiotensin converting en enzyme inverter. This basically the ACE2 is a subtype of the ACE molecule. Okay, it's a subtype of ACE molecule. Basically, the ACE is of ACE 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. This one is a second family of the ACE molecule. Okay, now what happens, guys? There's one more molecule which helps in the entry. This molecule here which helps in entry and this molecule is called as TMP T sorry TMRP SS2 okay so this molecule which is called as TMR TMR PSS2 it helps in the entry okay it helps in the entry now there's a lot of importance of this once the virus enters once this virus enters here this virus entered here now what happens the virus will start releasing its RNA. This is the RNA, guys. This is the positive single strand RNA. So RNA has entered the entered the host. This RNA will now lead to protein synthesis. Listen to me carefully now. These things are not easily understood. So I would request and advise you all to listen to me carefully. Now, what happens with the help of ribosome? That means utilizing the cell machinery of the host. That means utilizing the cell machinery of the host is RNA it utilize utilize with the ribosome of the host this is a ribosome of the host now this will make huge number of proteins again this RNA will make huge number of proteins again so suppose this is the RNA this is the RNA okay ribosomes are attached to the host the small unit and the last unit have attached to it now this will make huge enormous amount of proteins in the host Will make huge amount of proteins here guys do you know what are these rna called these rna are called as rd these rna are referred to as rdrp such rna such rna which can utilize the utilize the host cell machinery to make cells of their own is called as rdrp okay they're referred to as they're referred to as rd they are referred to as RDRP. Okay, they are called as RDRP. Remember, this RDRP is such an important thing. What is RDRP? It's RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Simple, hai? RNA dependent RNA polymerase. And remember, this will be an important target. This will be an important target to identify the SARS-CoV-2 infection in the host. What is it called? It is called as RDRP. 
आर डी आर पी ओके आर डी आर पी देखो वॉट हैपन्स वॉट हैपन्स नाउ दैट बेसिकली वेल इट एज एंटर्ड इन साइड once it has entered inside now the second thing happening here is because of this entry of this virus this proteins will now be utilized and will be having a rna again now with the help of the rna they now again match up the proteins will match up along with the rna along with the rna and these two will start making enormous number of entire virus particle they will make entire amount of virus particle like this okay they have made huge huge amount of virus particle now this virus particle will now start exiting the host via budding so what happens while it starts budding while it starts budding what happens this virus takes the part of the host receptor it exits out and therefore they have some membrane receptors okay they come out via the budding they come out by the budding so huge number of is released and eventually eventually the host type 2 nemocytes are all destroyed the host type 2 nemocytes are all destroyed okay not only there is release of virus particle virus particle but along with this there is destruction of the host type 2 nemocyte Now you might be wondering, sir. Okay, this is the pathophysiology. But why should we know this, guys? Each of the step I just mentioned, each of the step I just mentioned, they are all targets of some of the drugs that you must know now. Let me just explain to you. Let me just explain to you that basically what are. Let me just explain to you what are the steps here. Now this is very very interesting, guys. Listen to me again carefully. Look. first of all the virus has entered by the ace2 and the tmr pss has helped in the entry okay virus entered inside the rna came out the rna came out and this rna with the help of rdrp it has made the proteins so the proteins are made in the host using the cell machinery of the host got the point so this is called as rdrp and proteins come out combines with the rna and now it makes huge number of virus particle it comes out via the budding process and this is all the virus coming out but eventually they also lead to destruction it leads to destruction of the entire host particle now listen to me carefully some drugs have been made which can actually target these areas for example for example the binding of this this binding let me write this with red color or let me use a very you know separate color so it becomes very very prominent green color okay this thing here is being inhibited the binding is inhibited by hydroxy chloroquine hydroxy chloroquine okay second the tmp rss this which helps in the entry of the virus which helps in the entry of the virus this actually is inhibited by a drug called as nafomostat n a f n a f a m o s t a t nafomostat nafomostat inhibits the tmr pss again being used for the treatment of the sars cov 2 there are some direct rdrp inhibitors this inhibitors the name of the rdrp inhibitors are favi favi pivir f a v i f a v i favi favi p ravir okay favi pavir sorry f a v i p i favi p ravir okay now there are some you know there are some uh, inhibitors which can basically cause a termination of the a uh, protein synthesis and that happens because of the abnormal protein analog what i'm trying to say is suppose there is a you all know that in the genetic code the a pairs with t the c pairs with g a with t c with g now there are some drugs which looks like the guanine 
and therefore when there is a chance that the g will come the c will pair with g so instead of the g the drug comes and therefore they are called as they are called as basically the protease inhibitors they are called as protease inhibitors and the premature chain terminators that means there are some premature chain terminators i'll just write it separately here there are some the premature chain terminators let me write it here only the premature premature chain terminators and these are i just mentioned them as a name these are first of all remdesivir r a m d e remdesivir s e v i r okay v i r and secondly they are ribavirin r i b a v a r i n ribavirin okay ribavirin okay ribavirin and ultimately you all know that viruses are difficult to treat so when you want to decrease the entire inflammation you want to decrease the entire inflammation what you can do you can give corticosteroids and therefore we'll read the hydroxy corticosterone is one of a very important drug is often used to decrease the amount of inflammatory change occurring in the lung alveoli that means this forget this this come back in this image now basically if you are able to inhibit the cytokines you are able to decrease the inflammation now because you are able to decrease the inflammation guys what happens because you are able to decrease the inflammation what happens there is at the importance of corticosteroids so therefore therefore there are some immunomodulators just write it down there are some immunomodulators immuno modulators an example are they are steroids there are steroids okay corticosteroids obviously there are interleukin 6 inhibitors and they are called as toki li tocilizumab okay they are called as tocilizumab now to sum up everything what will you what isn't there is a way if you can basically make a antibody against this guys if you are able to make antibody against this and this antibody can inhibit this so this antibodies make a part of what you called as is make a part of something called as the plasma therapy called as convalescent convalescent plasma therapy so yes these are all the treatment options there are all the treatment options that basically you can get to treat a case of sars cov 2 isn't it getting very interesting interesting has just started and you will feel that just now we will move to the a diagnosis part and we move to the the options of having a vaccines in coronavirus so till now till now this is one important diagram that you must all understand because this becomes a complete understanding of the virus now tell me okay tell me that if there's any question you take it right now and then i will move ahead okay so i invite you all first of all to let me know whether have you understood this thing or not and if you have any problem in understanding till now okay so i'm waiting for your um, live chats on the youtube based on that i'll then move ahead if you have any notes bring it on if you don't have any notes and you have understood let me know that yes you have understood it and then i'll move to the next part which deals with the diagnosis part again very very interesting part okay so any doubts guys okay this one this is the just the trans membrane protein okay this one is just the trans membrane protein okay this tmp rss some some people call this tmp rss some call this tm rpss so this is called trans membrane protein trans membrane protein serine 2 okay serine 2 serine 2 this is the full form so yes you can also write this separate opposite also it can also be called as tm p r s s everything is okay now some books call this in the other way around also
blood investigation i'll talk i'll talk about the investigation separately also so this arb has any role in medication that's a very good question i'll talk about that dekho basically what happens when this virus is when this virus entered the body when this virus entered the body this ace inhibitor is ultimately getting down regulated our body plays a important role in down regulating the ace in ace ace molecule so if a patient is on ace inhibitor if a patient is on ace inhibitor theoretically theoretically he should not have a cold infection but actually what happens because the ace2 receptors are the one not the ace receptors so the ace are increased the ace2 are increased and therefore the patients have more severe infection but this is all theories let's not go into detail of that the tmp rss it helps in the entry of this virus brand energy i talk about that happy diwali thank you we have any other option i don't know what you're saying uh ivermectin you know there are some drugs which don't have a exact role nowadays like ivermectin they this this drug which is actually is a anti parasitic drug is shown to have a direct toxicity on the virus not proven and hence we not use nowadays why does lymphopenia occur basically because all the cells have come out into the into the alveoli so the cells have decreased into the uh, into the blood and therefore lymphopenia occurs Difference from ARDS, not exactly different from ARDS, but there are some severe form of ARDS which this disease has, which I'll just show you. So use of plasma therapy. So plasma therapy, this uh, plasma therapy can uh, make some antibodies, and the antibodies can basically act out against the S protein of this virus. Um, Biological safety levels. Let me talk about that later on. Uh, disease pathology doesn't occur in upper respiratory tract also it just has a multiplication there not exactly the process occur but the multiplication can occur there yes almost all of them have sars cov have also the same same type of issues no why they are being placed in the beta lineage i don't think there is a uh, there is a important uh, understanding of that it just on the microbiological classification system of the viruses i have remember i told you don't go into that they're not being used nowadays yes you know again um, some of the students are asking me about the neurological damage yes the sars cov 2 they have been shown to damage the lower motor neuron and upper motor neuron also so the gbs like finding the gulen belly syndrome like finding has been shown to be seen in some of the patients who actually are having suffering from sars cov 2 mutation can take place and has also occurred and that is the reason one of the reason why people say that uh, india has a less severe infection cytokine storm this is a cytokine storm see this is a cytokine storm dekho this is a cytokine storm the huge cytokine is coming out the cytokine storm here happy diwali no the multiplication occurs here that means the virus can also replicate by the rna polymerase but when it will use the host machinery the host machinery multiplication will occur in the lower respiratory tract so if the immunity is low all is a basic truth if there is no immunity the virus will extensively damage the entire host and therefore the damage will become very very severe azithromycin and all those things don't go to that they, they, they everyone can give that they're just to prevent the additional in, additional uh, you know uh, infection that can occur because of sars cov 2 yes symptomatic relief can always occur by bringing that kada and all the ace2 is less expressed in children and that is one of the reason why the infection is less severe in children because of the less number of ace2 molecules in the children eosinopenia you know though there is not very uh, clinically proven because i have seen so many cases of uh, you know my entire hospital is a covid uh, hospital and we have around 80 patients daily uh, on admitted in the in the wards so eosinopenia is not an important finding there so many people are asking about ivermectin which doesn't have such important role there about the constant plasma therapy i'll talk about that later on methylprednisolone and dexona both have been tried and has been found very useful doxy again doesn't have a lot of lot of role acute lung injury the same thing yes zinc supplementation will always help in improving the improving the you know immune status and therefore will help the uh, host person to fight with the infection all right this is entire thing is our life please watch the video again
thank you for okay this is next level my teaching is always like that if you have watched my videos i always go conceptually making the students understand what they need to know because i know that students don't know however you say whatever you say yes i i know this i know that i know that you don't know and that is the reason i make you the things explain in such a way that even though you know you again know it in a better way transverse myelitis associated with vaccination yes again you see vaccination has not been again um, you know a vaccination not available freely so let's not talk about that but yes any form of vaccination has a, a, a virus in the subdued form and the subdued virus can lead to some infection again the risk needs to be seen and that is why you need you do the various studies there Again, the biological effect is due to the immune uh, activation. So, these immune activation by the interleukin and the T cells, they can lead to damage of the uh, skin also, causing erythroderma. So, exactly I'm talking about the ACE inhibitor, guys. They go ACE mena because they are actually against the ACE. So, when the person is giving ACE inhibitor, the ACE2 molecule is overactivated and overexpressed. And thus, therefore, those patients have more severe infection and don't have less infection. Yes, same for pediatric and the adult age group. Yes, same. Lung fibers will always be a residual finding in case of any ARDA. That's a basic rule you must know. So, any renal patient or say anything like that will always have a severe infection. Always will have that. Yes, I'll talk about the redimer and the LME uh, heparin again. I just move ahead and talk about that. Loss of taste is because uh, the theory was that this virus will coat the olfactory receptors and therefore they have the less uh, uh, expression of this receptor which can lead to such damage. Neutrophilia is only relative, yes. The TLC count is low and therefore there is only a relative uh, neutropenia, neutrophilia. Sorry. Yes, because of the active phase reactant, there is increase in ferritin. I will talk about that just now. Okay. So, asymptomatic carrier is the reason because you know some people have such a good uh, good uh, uh, immune status that the virus has such a low level that the low level of virus do not, do not cause a severe infection. But suppose a person is of old age or has some immunocompromised status or have some uh, I'll say organs which are getting affected, they may lead to these over effect and can lead to severe uh, severe clinical features in these patients. Okay, so. Okay, they go. Now what happens guys, it is shown that this virus, I just write it here only, the COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2, the SARS-CoV-2 okay. Let me start again. again. Okay. The SARS-CoV-2, they also activate the pro-thrombotic, pro-thrombotic state in the body okay in the body and therefore there is a thrombosis risk okay thrombosis risk in these patients now they it is shown because the reason is and to, to diagnose this one to diagnose this one okay we often use d dimer levels d dimer levels if the d dimer level is very very high you give you give low molecular weight heparin okay also you must know also you must know that because the virus because the virus they lead to increase in the acute phase reactants reactants there are some markers that you must all be aware of and one of the most important marker used here is crp high crp high ferritin high crp high ferritin is one of those markers which is often used in diagnosis of the virus okay now because the virus often mimics because the virus often mimics a congestive cardiac failure because of the ARDS often to differentiate from the congestive cardiac failure to differentiate from congestive cardiac failure often a pro BNP is done Okay, the pro BNP, if you know it is a brain atrophic factor, the pro BNP is used, it is called as anti pro BNP, 
okay it's a better marker nt probe is a more sensitive to look for the congestive cardiac failure a nt probe bnp is used and the nt probe bnp is high the patient goes to the congestive cardiac failure and it is all used in emergency department okay and if it's low then you start thinking about the covid 19 and you start with the diagnosis with the rt pcr or the covid antigen i will talk about that in a bit in a bit from now now see also to differentiate from bacterial sepsis to differentiate from bacterial sepsis sepsis the patients also are diagnosed with the pro calci pro calci tonin levels okay also the patients are used with a pro calci tonin levels okay pro calci tonin levels for the point the pro cal levels are often used to differentiate from the bacterial sepsis differentiate from the bacterial sepsis now the final thing is all about the lab diagnosis so here we come to the last part in which we deal about the deal about the bacterial sepsis so see i'll show you some good images here look dekho see the first one this is how the normal alveoli is the normal alveoli with the exchange of carbon dioxide and, and oxygen occurring normally this is a healthy healthy alveoli now in the mild case of the infection where the patient has just a fever and maybe a myalgia and all myalgia and all the thing remains like this only okay but when the patient starts getting infected infected what happens there is huge multiplication of the virus there and therefore now comes the next form of the stage 2 disease in which the patient has mild amount of mild amount of respiratory damage because of the fluid accumulating in the alveoli the fluid accumulation occurs the carbon dioxide oxygen exchange decreases and there is huge amount of cytokine coming out of this entire alveoli and this is the case when a patient has moderate symptoms the moderate symptoms includes mild hypoxemia he has increased respiratory rate increased respiratory rate and the x ray finding and the ct scan finding often shows bilateral infiltrates and will show you the ground glass appearance at this stage ground glass appearance at this stage now a severe form occurs when the patient has huge amount of those fluids coming out and the fibrin the protein also comes out and the entire now lungs become fibrotic now at this stage at this stage called as hyper inflammatory stage the patient has a finding like ARDS he may go to shock and may go to multi organ failure at this stage the patient's interleukin 6 level is very very high ferritin is very very high and the dimer level is very very high and therefore this is a very severe stage when the protein rich fluid along with the uh, normal fluid as the edema also occurs this is a severe form this is a moderate form and look at the difference here you see only the fluid coming out and here what you see is the fluid along with the protein coming out the moderate form and the severe form is what you see here what you see here okay now guys if you are liking this video please like this video make sure you like this video before you stop anyhow watching the video make sure you have liked this video before you move ahead okay it means a lot lot to all of us who are working so hard just to bring you the quality education that you all deserve to have okay chalo let's move ahead now we move to lab diagnosis lab diagnosis so how do you diagnose a case of covid-19 infection we make sure that you have respiratory respiratory tract samples okay make sure you have respiratory tract samples now this can be upper respiratory tract samples or can be a lower respiratory tract samples okay the upper respiratory tract samples what are these they include the nasopharyngeal the nasopharyngeal swab naso pharyngeal swab and the oro pharyngeal swab okay so it's often referred to as np swab and the op swab this is short form you may get also in the questions np and the op swab also called as a throat swab but in the lower respiratory tract in the lower tract in the lower tract you can use the bal bronco ar lavage you can use the endotracheal aspirate aspirate now these are the other sample which are used but to be very frank the better sample is this one this is a better sample okay the better sample is the upper respiratory tract sample okay other samples apart from this are usually not used like if you talk about the urine stool blood saliva they are not used for diagnosis of the antigen or the virus okay now remember you can often use a sample transport media okay sample 
sample transport media this is a media often given with the kits now if you have seen those kits i'll explain to you what is done so suppose this is a swab okay you ask the patient to tilt the head at 70 degree like this and you go inside okay you go inside the end of the wall make sure this is a plastic tip so that it does not so it does, if, if you use a wooden if you use a steel it will not bend now this may cause a damage to the in in the upper and the lateral wall so when you go inside you take a swab from there and you come out okay you come out and that swab is then put in the media is then put in the media okay it is also often called as viral transport media vtm often called as viral transport media vtm okay viral transport media vtm and then sent to the lab now what and how can you diagnose these things but the various way of diagnosing the tests if you talk tests the tests available are all the uh, tests which can use for a uh, direct testing or it can be indirect testing now direct testing is all about the antigens and the virus particle indirect is all about the antibody testing okay so let's talk about first of all the test which will use a virus isolation the virus isolation test is not used it will require a bsl3 category lab biosafety level 3 okay bsl3 category lab and therefore it is not very commonly done the same thing is for viral culture also, virus culture also, okay, the BSL3 category lab and this is not used for diagnostic purpose, okay, then not for diagnostic, this A and B not for diagnostic purpose, okay, not for diagnostic purpose, okay, now what about the other way of diagnosis, so you can use the, uh, I'll say the third one is the antigen test also called as POCT, POCT, so POCT which means point of care testing, it means point of care testing, POCT, the point of care testing, it is has, I will show you also, there is a, uh, there is a card like this, there is a area where you put the sample, okay, you put the sample here, and this is a chain at the table, in which there are two areas, the control line, the test line, the control line should always come positive, to make the test valid now if the test line comes positive it is positive if the test line comes negative it is negative okay it becomes negative okay now if you talk about this one if please understand if antigen test is positive then it is always positive then it is positive okay then patient is covid positive but if the antigen is negative always do the R T P C R testing for confirmation. Now this rule you must all know as a medical student. Okay, you must all know about this as a medical student. Okay. Now see, I'll show you one uh, image in which you understand is better again. Look. Now this is the test I did today only. Today is this today's test. I think the date is uh, mentioned not very clearly seen anyhow look this is how we do okay look at the time look at the time yes today's sample look they go the test was done you read and report the time okay you put the patient's note and the name and look at the area we put the sample the t is the test and c is the control okay now this has come positive so we have to report this patient as as positive and we have to update this data in the in the icmr register form okay it's a very well maintained uh, form it's a very well maintained data setup and you should all be proud as to how the indian uh, medical society is has come up and made such a beautiful network in which you can actually upload every data every real time okay but this was the antigen testing let's talk about the next one this d1 is the rt pcr i'll talk about the the next one is all about the RNA detection okay it's about the RNA detection now this will include this will include some various tests like if you know about this it's called as the reverse transcriptase RT-PCR real time the real time RT-PCR now I hope this RT is not real time it is reverse okay transcriptase okay reverse transcriptase okay RT-PCR now you must know other thing that you can do it is a cartridge based 
some are cartridge based and those are referred to as the CB NAT okay and one of them is chip based chip based the chip based is called as the true NAT okay true NAT the NAT if you know this NAT stands for this NAT it stands for nucleic acid amplification testing okay it stands for nucleic acid amplification testing it is called as NAT nucleic acid amplification testing now it is important to understand what are the targets that you actually test for now here I told you the genes okay I just tell you about the genes again they go you talk about the genes again so look at the genes that virus has the genes has a ORF that means overeating frame which is actually the non structural gene non structural gene okay now this is one of them ORF apart from this in the structural genes I hope you all remember there is a RDRP RDRP remember the RDRP so this is one you will always look for always look for apart from this you can look for the S S gene making S protein so look for the S gene look for the E gene M gene or the N gene now among so many choices you have what is the choice that you look for I'll just tell you they go look here you will look for ORF okay ORF you look for the ORF 1A and the 1B I just showed you the image 1A and the 1B apart from this apart from this you also look for you also look for the S gene okay the E gene envelope gene you look for the N gene the neuramidase neuramidase N gene and the RD RDRP gene okay RDRP gene okay RDRP gene so all of them should be look, looked for and this will make the targets now if they are positive the patient is reported as positive now there's something called as CT value something called as CT value guys this is a big big confusion first of all do you at all have this information what exactly is CT value they go in the real-time PCR you add the fluorescent dyes you add the fluorescent dyes and you make it in a PCR machine so the PCR machine it allows the RNA or the DNA to multiply when this RNA or DNA multiplies what happens that as this RNA or DNA is multiplying that is increasing the fluorescence is also increasing the CT value is a number of cycle when only understand CT value is equal to the number of cycles it's a number of cycles number of cycles when the reaction mixture the reaction reaches threshold threshold value this means now if you don't know write this in clearly low CT value refers to high viral load because this will mean this will mean even with a lesser virus load sorry even with a lesser viral cycle the threshold value has reached that means less amount of cycle was required to attain the threshold value the threshold value for the viral testing low CT value high viral load and this is the one you must all know you must all know okay low CT value high viral load okay high viral load and I'm very sure that many of you might getting confused but look at the CT value in the patient's report and CT value reporting is now must according to the ICMR guidelines CT uh, value reporting is must according to the ICMR guidelines okay okay apart from this you can also look for the antibody testing okay you can look for the antibody testing antibody testing is antibody me look for one thing that the IgM the IgM doesn't have a lot of role but yes IgG has an important role in looking for the surveillance testing for the surveillance testing I'll show you a graph it's a very interesting graph it'll make you understand better look at this a graph now in this graph if you look at this graph guys sorry in this graph look at the symptom onset so this is the where the symptom is onsetting now this blue one is where you are looking for the virus virus 
red one is the antigen okay red one is the antigen okay red one is the antigen so now what are looking is this virus and antigen are quite detectable even before the onset of symptom has begun this line is symptom onset so even before the onset of symptoms the virus or the antigen can be looked for but obviously getting a positive will depend upon how increased the virus load is now see one week after one week after the symptom has onset the igm and the igg will start increasing the igm look at this purple line the igm will increase and will start decreasing but the igg will persist and this makes a basis of how and why do we use the convalescent plasma therapy we are not at all sure how much the igg stays for how much long the igg stays for but yes the igg stays long for at least two months is what my own experience is okay so what i want to tell you here is after one week of the onset of symptoms the igm and igg starts rising the igm will fall after this the you see the third week but the igg will persist but in no case the antibody should be used for diagnosis the antibody should be looked only for looking for number one whether the patient can give plasma or not second surveillance studies that means how many people would have got infected in the area number three they can be used to see what is the immune status of this person but that means whether the person was exposed to the virus or not but again we are not very specific antibodies that means this antibody is not necessarily only against the SARS-CoV-2 other respiratory virus can also induce a similar type of antibody in these patients okay so one line you must know is how does this virus actually antibody come to look at the line this one is the onset of symptom okay so look the virus starts increasing this is a virus so it can be diagnosed okay now after three weeks after if you look at this if you look at this after actually one and a half weeks not three weeks actually after this around one week one week the igm is starting to increase will also fall down but the igg will persist like this this is the igg and this one is igm okay and this one is the virus which can be looked by which can be looked by the rt-pcr or the antigens okay rt-pcr or the antigens this is about the antigen testing antigen testing uh, sorry it is about the not antigen sorry the antibody testing antibody testing now this is the onset of clinical feature this is the onset of clinical features remember this line guys this line here is where the onset of the symptoms has occurred so one week after the antibody is increasing so suppose the person has got infected yesterday and looking for the antibody now you won't get anything okay you won't get anything and remember among them igg is the one we actually look for even though total antibody can be looked for but the igg is often looked for looking for the surveillance studies often look for the surveillance studies now who are the people who will look who will take for the convalescent plasma therapies convalescent plasma therapy again this is done in my own hospital so i know about a lot about this convalescent plasma therapy so this is what you need the donor he should be 42 days after symptom onset 42 days after symptom onset or 28 days after a negative rt pcr report okay so these are the people whom you will select for the convalescent plasma therapy you take the plasma distribute in loads of 250 and 250 bags and you give it to the patient who wants this and this is often helpful in the early part of the uh, early part of the um, you know um, pathophysiology because once the virus has already entered and destroyed everything you can't do a lot about it so before the virus enters the uh, that uh, is about to entering the type 2 pneumocytes then is where this whole thing is more effective 
and therefore nowadays is seen that tonal plasma therapy doesn't have that important promising therapy as it was seen to have a, a role in when it was actually brought into forward finally the vaccine the vaccine status we all are waiting you all know about it so we all are waiting for the vaccine status but what they are doing is they are looking for the s antigen and that s antigen they are making the subdued form of s antigen and this ant ant antigen will be made as an active immunity it's called as you know uh, a vaccination so there that s antigen in a subdued form will be given to the patient who actually needs it or actually people like us that s antigen will make the antibody against that so when the real virus comes we are ready to fight with it but vaccine we are right now waiting for it i'm very sure that whenever the vaccine comes we all we all will be very very happy and that will make our life as usual as it should be but before that happens we all will need to take the proper uh, you know a proper uh, i'll say precautions which will include the hand hand hygiene the hand wash the hand rub and you all know about the you know uh, uh, face mask you all know about the uh, wearing the proper precautions when you go to the hospitals uh, and even not only proper precautions you should also be throwing the proper precaution the right uh, in the right dustbins and the uh, bio safety uh, bins that is a yellow bin and the red bin in which it should be actually thrown and uh, be safe stay safe and i'm very sure that we will actually come out to be victorious from this notorious infection that has actually uh, claimed so many lives and uh, i don't know what will happen but i'm very sure that as soon as the vaccine comes uh, we are quite um, you know ready to fight with this uh, infection and that will make our life as usual as it should be so thank you guys for watching this video i am very sure this video was very helpful to you to understand the basic every a to z of the covid 19 infection i have tried to make it uh, you know short and short and sweet so that you can understand the basic pathophysiology you understand the basic microbiology you understand the basic treatment process you understand the basic diagnostic process and eventually you also you already know how to get prevention from the covid 19 infection because we all know prevention is better than the cure thank you so guys uh, about the feluda feluda is just uh, another uh, testing strategy a uh, feluda is basically based on uh, you know it's based on the a uh, newest method uh, called as crispr cas9 system of diagnosing system so yes if you have any uh, comments and thoughts do let me let me know so that i can maybe solve it out other than that please like the video and make sure that you actually this is my basic request after the video ends don't put this your comments only in the live chats make sure that if you have liked the video and you li liked how uh, the our our you know basic uh, way of teaching was and you liked uh, the official gams uh, session so please make sure that you put a comment after the video ends so that we can all um, actually get benefited from your uh, comments if you can actually watch it and we will again come with that in a better way in a more you know better arranged sessions so make sure you put your comments before you uh, stop this video you put your likes if you actually have at all benefit from the video and um, i'm very sure that we will keep on bring this again in future thanks a lot guys for uh, for your brilliant support and your brilliant understanding so i can again see so many people again still watching um, yes alice uh, solve basic doubts so what happens to calcium levels in the bacterial sepsis no don't don't confuse calcium into the uh, procalcium procal is basically a precursor molecule of calcium and the procal is increased only in the bacterial infection not the calcium don't confuse procal with a cal okay surely we bring up with more and more sessions uh quality pathology is all because of viral activation of fibrin uh, fibrin and the fibrin degraded products so basically what happens the virus directly activates the fibrinogen pathway because of which uh, this virus is so notorious to activate the collection pathway if the antigen is positive and the patient is asymptomatic the patient has has covid 19 infection there is no doubt on that okay reports comes to be negative even though the person has covid so how do you know that the patient has covid if the patient as the report is negative Um, now please don't pass this comments the who has said this and that without a, a a good proof okay we are here to talk about science 
we are not talk about here to talk newspapers we are our medical students we are not just general public yes you can fill in your uh, official jams so that you can get your emails um, and e session also so thanks you everyone i just uh, recognize who who are just messaging me thank you ram shubham shivani thank you disa uh, thank you ORF is open reading frame. Thank you, Ajish. False positive is not very common. False negative is more common now. Can reinfection be possible? Yes, few cases have been shown to have reinfection. A second wave, uh, Thawa, we are looking at a third wave right now in New Delhi. So I don't know how many waves will come. So we have to watch these waves till the time the vaccine is there. RT-PCR is done again and if it comes negative for the first time, that means the patient is already negative. Thanks, Parth. Thank you, Arlasan. Demer indicates sepsis and DIC. Yes, obviously, yes. And therefore, you give uh, heparin. Else, why should you give heparin? Thanks, Vineet. Thanks, Mega. Thanks, Praheli. Antibody in the COVID just... Uh, no, no, no. Antibody does not guarantee protection from reinfection. Does not guarantee. Thanks, Sarnik. Thanks, Shrishta. Loss of taste is all I told you. Please watch the video again. Thanks, Nitishkar. Thanks, Shandan. Symptomatic relief is often enough to treat the COVID-19 infection. In fact, as you all we have known, the 90% cases are very, very mild infection. We just require a symptomatic control. Thanks, Ritika. CD sensitive of COVID and RTPs are negative. So, yes, you should always or always do RTPs are again. Definitely. Thanks, Nadita. Thanks, Vineet, Sneha, and Shravasi. Thanks, Siddhi, Haman, Bhanu Priya. I have explained a lot, loss of lot of taste again and again. Please watch the video. So yes, uh, the ECMO is preventing death because when you go to the invasive level of ventilation, the invasive level actually uh, damages the uh, uh, lungs uh, and alive to a more extent compared to the non-invasive methods. And therefore, ECMO is better till the time the patient can actually withstand not getting ventilated. ACE to is not, not beneficial. No, not beneficial at all. Any of the targets are positive, it is positive. Thanks, Rams, Thava, Purushottam, Praveen, thank you. Shomadeep, really, really, thank you. Pathophysiology of diarrhea is just due to the direct in, uh, damage of the uh, GIT to the, due to the COVID-19 infection. Life of antibodies, maybe three months, maybe two months, studies have not come up. So I cannot tell you for sure because I tell you, I only base my teaching on good articles i don't take articles just from any any paper i always read lancet any jm which are well-renowned articles which should you read okay nilliparanus women should always donate do, uh, can donate plasma only because when the patient become multiparous she is always exposed to multiple hla and multiple hla can induce multiple hla antibody in the patient which can lead to i hope you got it correct which can lead to the uh, uh the finding and that is anti hla antibodies and the antigen can react and can lead to ARDS like features um in the donations thank you ankit thank you shubra coronel i don't know coronel so thanks a lot guys thank you very much uh, for a patient listening so i just close the session and um, if you do have any other queries, uh, you can definitely join my telegram group. My telegram group comes from my name, uh, Dr. Praveen Pathology uh, Discussion Forum. So you can just type that name in the telegram group. You can find that and you can join there also. And I'm very sure that uh, we'll bring more and more sessions with this, uh, bringing you to the closing of the session with a small saying that whatever happens, we should always and always stay positive in the intent of our life and uh, just uh, make sure that you work hard till the time you do not need to introduce yourself. So till the time I need to introduce myself, I will always keep on giving you the best that I can actually give you. Thank you from entire team of GAMS and me. Uh, wish you all the best.
Stay ahead and stay blessed. Bye-bye.